views from the bench. I am Ryan Blake, and today I'm excited to have Coach Steve Leibert on with us. So, Steve, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Good. The COVID-19 quarantines kind of got <laughs> me trapped, but I'm good. Yeah. Um, now, Monday I had Rich Smith on, um, on the show, and um, I believe we met the same exact way last year at the Coleman Cup Regional Practice. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, and uh, um, one of the things at the regional Coleman Cup practice uh, that I, that was fantastic. It was all of us there. Uh, the the you know how beneficial it was for the skaters. But one of the things I took away from that was how beneficial it was for for me as a coach, um, getting to know you and Rich and some of the other coaches. Because I walked in there thinking like you know like I had a certain set of philosophies and ideals, and after meeting you guys. You really changed a lot of that. The way you were able to to work with my drills, add progressions, um, correcting the mistakes and things like that, and helping kids critically think and understand the game really helped my game as a coach evolve. And um, I just want to say, you know, that was an amazing weekend. Um, I've gotten to know you over the last year, and I just want to say, like, you've you've really opened my eyes up to uh, different ways of coaching and just what a fantastic coach you are. So I'm excited to have you on and pick your brain on some things like that today, too. So uh, before we get into any of the hard questions, do uh, you want to give me a background on your playing career? I will. First off, I'll like thank you yeah. for the compliment. But yeah. Uh, yeah, that was fun last year. And it was yeah. fun enough that I had volunteered and signed up for the Coleman Cup again. Yep. Because I knew Rich. He just asked me, hey, yep. do you want to help out? And I'm like, oh, I'd love to help out. So then when we went up to Fond du Lac, I was like, oh, like, how's this going to go? Yep. You know, I didn't know. But it was kind of a great open atmosphere of, hey, coaches, like, if you've mm -hmm. got a good idea, throw it out here on the table and we'll talk about it. And yep. so I kind of appreciated the way you ran it because it was open enough to allow everybody their input mm -hmm. and to say, hey, let's try this or let's switch this this way. So that was kind of fun. Oh, yeah, it was. It, and that was the thing that I loved about it. And this is kind of goes into one of those roles and responsibilities of assistant coaches or um, and you guys weren't assistant coaches at the time. But it's what I think is a great responsibility for assistant coaches is that I remember I laid out my first practice, like the first drill we ran and we did the drill. We called the kids in and then you jumped on and you're like, let's add this progression. And then we went back and we did that drill again as that progression. You saw something out there. And you had the confidence and you had the know know with all to to you know let me know that hey, this is something that can add value to these kids. And for the rest of the practice, that entire day and the next day, it was just like one after the other. And it was like it was amazing. Like so um that was one of the great things about that weekend. So um it was. Yeah. So give me a little background on your playing career. So my playing career, so started young, started yeah. young. No. I actually was pretty lucky. You know, my dad didn't really do any sports. Mm -hmm. He had moved all over the place growing up. And uh, I had an older brother, you know, so like my parents really didn't know anything about sports, mm -hmm. which as I grew up, I loved playing sports. And the neighbor played hockey. Okay. And it was pay a dollar to go on the ice. Mm -hmm. So you paid a dollar when you showed up. If you didn't show up, you didn't pay. And that was it. And so my older brother started playing. And so I was like six or seven years old and I wanted to play bad enough that my parents just started me in the middle of the season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm assuming I was awful. <laughs> I don't really remember that part, but I was assuming yeah. I was awful. The next year I played the full year. And mm -hmm. at our level at that time, we actually played, if you've ever been to Madison Ice Arena, I grew up in Madison. Okay. If you've ever been to Madison Ice Arena, you've seen the studio rink. Mm -hmm. We played on the studio rink without goalies. Okay. So they just had a board in front of the net with one hole in the bottom, like shoot the puck for luck. <laughs> that was it. But I was all in. Yep. I was all in. And we live, it's about a five minute walk if you have to walk around the streets. Mm -hmm. It's about a two minute walk if you cut through people's backyards to get to a park where they had on top of the hill, they have a hockey rink on the bottom. They have a pond and they had a warming house right next to the pond that they freeze up. And so I wouldn't even walk down to the warming house. I would cut through yards, go to the rink, put my skates on at the rink and then just skate as long as I could. 
yep. and get in trouble every night coming home. <laughs> because my dad would be like, hey, you don't get dinner. If yep. you're not here on dinner time, you don't get dinner. And so I would always miss dinner. And my mom would always be like, I have it in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> and so like my brother and I went down there and played all the time. Yep. So like I was a pond duck and I yep. still enjoy it now. I'll still go yep. outside and play uh, pond hockey when I can. Mm -hmm. So just kind of grew up in that youth organization. There really wasn't, as I got older and hit Bantams, there was, uh, the Capitals were just starting. Okay. And I went and tried out for the Capitals and then my dad said, hey, we don't have enough money for that. So you're going to play, you know, at the yep. time it was Westmoreland. Okay. We had no mascot. It was just Westmoreland hockey. And so I played that growing up. And then I played midget hockey in high school. Then I graduated high school at 5'6". Yeah. <laughs> the games changed a little bit. But at yeah. that time, all I heard was, you're too small. Yeah. You're too small to play this game. You're going to get hurt. You're too." I actually heard that all the way through high school. You're too small. You're going to get hurt playing this game. And it bugged me because my older brother is, I don't know, 6'1", 6'2". Yep. And he was big in high school. And my younger brother is about 6'3". I graduated high school at 5'6". I grew after high school. So okay. I'm now about 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 but all that came after high school. Mm -hmm. So after high school, I just kind of folded the tent, thought I'm going to figure out what I need to do in this world, which yep. took me a while to figure that out. And then a couple years later, my brother who had left town came back and started coaching and goes, hey, why don't you coach with me? Mm -hmm. And so that started me on this hill <laughs> that I've been on forever. Yeah. You bring up two awesome things in your bio of your playing career. One was I love hearing about the pond, right? Because pond, playing out on a pond and playing on the outdoor rinks is not a lot of things that we have much more in Wisconsin. Um, how do you think that has impacted the game, not having that free pond hockey to play anymore? I think it's pretty significant. Yeah. I really do. I think that free play, mm -hmm. that no expectations of play, that I had to hold my own. So mm -hmm. when I was out there and I was 8, 9, 10 years old, and there were high school kids out there, you know when you're really young, they kind of give you the puck sympathy wise, the yeah. pity puck. You know, they give you some pity puck time. And I never wanted that. Yep. Like I wanted to keep up with those guys and play. And so that unstructured play, like I really liked it. I do think to go off on a little bit of a tangent, yep. I think sometimes that gets, you know, people think that that is a panacea, that that's a cure all. If kids yep. could just go play because some kids don't like it. Mm hmm. And I grew up with a whole bunch of kids in our neighborhood and, you know, they didn't like that. Yep. They didn't want that competition. They wanted to go, they would go skate down in the pond and set up their own games. Okay. Or maybe they could be, you know, the hero of their environment. Yep. And I wanted it the other way. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to be up there with the big guys and figuring out how I could get that puck and keep that puck more often. Yeah. So I do think like, for the competitive kids out there, like that's a big missing factor of just that free play, go figure out how to get the puck, keep the puck in not the world's greatest environment, right? You're going to trip on cracks in the ice. You're going to miss the puck. There's going to be snow. You got to work your way through that. Yeah. That's something that like I've realized too about like the unstructured play environment, the, the outdoor element of the game is that like, um, when you have an unstructured environment like that, it allows your brain to develop a little bit more. And what I mean by that is if you're thinking about the game in, in, in terms of a practice, right? A coach will set up a cone here. You catch the pass, you go around the cone. You know, your, your mind is set on the cone going around it, right? There's not a lot of other things going on. But when you're playing on a pond, like, you you know, let's just say you're doing another drill like that. You, you Like you just said, you're worried about the crack in the ice. You're worried about the amount of snow that you just picked up when you're doing the drill on the ice. You're worried about is a puck going to bounce, right? Because it's it's unstructured. It's it's not, it's not, you know, cookie cutter that we're used to experiencing. So that is one of the great things I love about, you know, 
pond hockey. Is there, there's a lot of things that help your game that you do that you don't even realize you're doing. But that's the other thing, too, that you brought up that I wanted to touch on a little bit. You, said you brought up height, right? And in today's game, uh, I, I, I felt the same thing. I was five, six, five, seven. My parents gave me the, the, the proverbial, you're five, six, you weigh about a buck 40. You're not going D1. And I was, you know, that's when my world was like, what? Like, I, I, I was like, mom, I still want to go to the NHL. And, and, she, was, and she was like, no, like you're, you're, you're five, six, you weigh 140 pounds. Like you, you got a very good offer to go play NCAA division three, take it. Like, and now in today's game, I really don't hear much talk about height. Now it's still out there, but can you elaborate on how that game has changed from maybe when we played or you played growing up and how height has changed and now it's more based on a skill set? Yeah, I can. It's it's just such a big difference now. Yep. You know, the small guy that can process the game and think it quickly and make decisions on the ice and make his teammates better, coaches love that guy now and they'll give him a chance. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, right, some of the rules have changed to help that happen. Yep. You know, when I grew up and even when I began coaching high school, there were guys like we used to call it the water skier. You know, you didn't mm -hmm. really have to back check because you could kind of just latch on with your stick. And the guy couldn't break out fast away from the puck. He got slowed down off the puck. And then the guy didn't have to work too hard to back check because he could just slow you up in the zone right there. And that type of interference, as that goes away, you know, that big 6'2", six, 6'4", six, guy with that giant reach and that giant stick, like he can't use it to slow people down yep. and make the ice suddenly really small. So it gave space for that little guy to make plays. And then as they take head hits out of the game, we could click on an NHL game right now and see guys do turn back, spinoramas that they would get crushed on, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yep. And so it really has just opened up some more space for players on the ice, which yep. then that little guy, if he can't process the game, it's not going to matter. But yep. if that little guy can process the game and think it and make decisions, like it gives him a chance to play. Yep. And you're seeing a lot of the NHL players and then even down through the ranks of NCAA D1 and D3 right now where um, players who are 5'6", 5, 5'7", 5, 5, 5, they're, they're making it to the NHL and they're flourishing. Um, and it's because they're able to think the game, to process the game quickly. But you brought up one thing that was awesome. You talk about space, right? And the players who are able to find space and utilize that space are the dangerous ones on the ice, right? And it doesn't matter if you're six foot four or five foot four. If you can find space, process that information of what to do in that space, you're a dangerous player. So, um, but we also, uh, getting off of your playing career question, but uh, one of the things I want to talk about is your coaching career. Where did you start? You talked about you, you kind of got into it with your older brother, but uh, who do you coach now and kind of elaborate on your history of it? Well, I started at Pee Wee C's. Yeah. <laughs> so I started at Pee Wee C's, uh, moved up, started coaching a Bantam team, yep. and then a uh, high school job opened. Okay. And one of the kids that I'd coached, even though it was out of district, mm -hmm. his dad knew me. He said, you've got to apply for that job. You've got to apply for that job. So applied for that job and was at Middleton for probably 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then the last five years at Madison West. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I think it was 92. 92, 93 was the first season when I started coaching high school hockey. And uh, Jeff Sowers' kid was on the team. So that mm -hmm. was fantastic. Had a great resource there and could go talk to him about hockey. Um, in between there, they built Capital Ice in mm -hmm. Middleton. And so the Madison Capitals moved there. So also for years, I kind of doubled up. And I would coach whatever team Bob Suter was coaching. Okay. Bob or Gary Suter. So I coached U18s or U16s and would kind of flip around, uh, depending on what Bob or Gary was coaching. Bob gave up for a couple of years, stopped coaching while Gary came in and coached his kids through there. So I just hopped on and helped Gary. So I coached that tier one U18 and U16 teams for probably eight, nine years at least. Okay. And then in between there, I have enough uh, brothers and sisters with kids. So I've helped out, you know, at Cross Ice, 
you know, band practices, peewee practices, squirt practices. So I've kind of stayed in touch with all that. Actually helped form Middleton. Now they're the Middleton Cardinals, but they were the Middleton Wings because that was uh, Verona Middleton Co-op, the youth program was. And then once Capital Ice was built, uh, Middleton decided to start their own youth program. So kind of was in on that, you know, as the uh, coaching director for that club as well. Okay. And we've also gotten to grow our relationship as, as, as coaches because uh, now you're, you also work with Team Wisconsin and the Wee program and stuff like that too. And that's where I've gotten to learn a little bit more from you as well. So, um, but uh, I want to get to some of the co- coaching questions and things like that right now. Um, usually I used to ask a question, what's your first five minutes of practice? Now I want to kind of go into the game management stuff like that. Give me what your, your game warm ups look like. What are you trying to accomplish? And, you know, uh, what, and what are you doing out there? Well, there's a couple things. And one thing it's, you mentioned team Wisconsin. Yeah. I learned that quickly because our fall season's so short Yep. and we just didn't have much time. And so many kids now are used to warming up before, you know, they have their off ice game warm up. Yep. So what we used our off ice game warm up for was to run through a little bit of our structure. Yep. We were actually down in St. Louis and they had a big grassy field. And then the morning it was raining, they actually had a gym attached. And we asked if we could go in and use the gym. And we ran through a bunch of line rushes. Yep. And we had guys, we just had a couple little Nerf balls and we were whipping the ball around and running Mm -hmm. through some line rushes. And, you know, we're active, we're moving, we're throwing the ball around. The kids are having some fun. And we actually went through some of the structure that we wanted to see on the ice. Okay. And I'm like, wow, that's a super effective way to use warm-ups. Yeah. Gives you some time to talk about it, and mm-hmm. then the kids can go on the ice and try it out. Mm-hmm. So I was really happy with how that went there. Okay. And then when we get on the ice, like, it gets tricky. And as kids get older, it you know, there's some kids who want certain things, and there's some kids who need certain things. And the goalies obviously need to be warmed up. And as the goalies get older and they start hitting 14, they know what they need to see. Yep. And they know what they want. And sometimes as a coach, you got to ask them. You got to pull it out of them a little bit. And so then I'll set up warm ups for that purpose. So part of the warm up will be okay, the goalies need this. And then even in our high school team this year, there was a couple of kids, right, that, you know, their skill level is not fantastic. So they had a passing drill that they had to do the first five minutes of warm ups. Okay. So they specifically had a passing drill that they would do. So sometimes we'll use warmups as extra practice time. Yeah. And then I do like, like if it's a youth game and we're going to have warmups and then start the game, like something. So we have some fast feet and fast hands, you know, right before the horn blows and then we drop the puck and we're going to be a fast team. Yep. So, so, um, after that, what are some of the things uh, and requirements you have for your team before a game? Like, how 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 early do you want them there? Do you? I mean, obviously, you talked about you already have them doing a pregame warm up. Is there any other things that you do and you try to emphasize to your players before a game starts? So you know, time is so important, and parents and everybody else sink so much time, you know, into everything, including yep. sports, that. I'm not going to tell them to be there 90 minutes early unless I have a specific plan to use those 90 minutes. Yep. And I agree, right? Contradict myself a little bit here. There is some time that the kids need by themselves kind of goofing off. Okay. Right? Yep. Throwing a ball around the locker room, talking in the locker room, get to know each other, feel good about each other. And so they need a little bit of that time. Mm -hmm. But I keep that to a minimum. So if I say – you know, you're 60 minutes before the game time, 60 yep. minutes before ice time, we're there. Like then that's the plan. They get there. We'll do something for a few minutes, maybe go over something tactically, strategy wise. Then they have some free time. Okay. Then we warm up, then they get dressed, then they go. Mm-hmm. And players hate me, but sometimes <laughs> I'll give them 15 minutes Yep. to get ready. And I'll be like, tough luck, goalies. You better learn how to be fast. And I don't give them a lot of downtime 
It is warm up, get ready in as short amount of time as we can, and then we go to get on the ice. Yep. And that is an adjustment for some kids because they're used to kind of doing their talking then. Yep. They want to just kind of hang out and not get ready. And they, no, you've got 15 minutes. You're on the clock. Mm -hmm. And especially if it's the first couple of times of the team, like, you know, I have to train them a little bit to get that routine down. So I'll have to stand there and remind them, hey, you've got five minutes. And if you're late, you're late. That's your problem. You'll miss some shifts because of it. Okay. Um, now, one of the things I want to ask you was this. Down three, one in a hockey game, five minutes left. When do you as a coach start looking at pulling your goalie? Oh, I, I love that question because I, I'm i all in on the analytics of the earlier you pull a goalie, yep. the more time you have to score. Yep. I like to say the moment I pull a goalie, I've decided to decide the game. Okay. Because if they score and it's 4-1, it's over. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I weigh into it, and I'll tell the kids post-game, like I just don't think we were smart enough or our compete level wasn't high enough that we didn't deserve to pull our goalie. Yep. We hadn't done the work beforehand to put that sixth guy on. Yep. And take a shot at it. And But I start thinking early. And I start mm-hmm. thinking, like, depending – if it's a high school game, competitive time, I'll start thinking, okay, where are we at in lineups? Who yep. do they have coming on? What do we have for a timeout? Right? Because sometimes if you can double up your best players with a yep. timeout, you know, that's going to give you a chance. Because 3-1, you need two goals. Yeah. Time to score those two goals. Yep. So my normal mark – if I can do it, if I'm down by two, is right around three minutes. Okay. Which it's kind of generic, right? Because everybody used to think, you know, that minute and a half mark, yeah. you know, when you're down three, two, or two, one. And I just kind of doubled it. But mm-hmm. I start thinking about it early. Yeah. That is something that I find interesting because that's, I like what you said. You like to put the game in your hands, right? Like you make that decision of the game, right? Because that's what it is. Four, one, it's, ugh. but you're kind of dictating the play to your players. Like we're going to go for it right now. Right. Like I got the faith that we're going to try and get this done. So, um, you know, it's kind of like, even though you're down three, one, you're still determining the outcome, right? You're the one that's in your hand. You guys are making the action. Um, now you brought up compete level and uh, compete level is one of those things that I, I love talking about because it's one of those things I think kids just, they need to have. Um, can you, like it's compete level. Like I always to ask coaches, like you don't have talent. Let's just say talent's off the board. What is one thing you want in your team? If you, if, if it's not talent, like one trait to in, in your team. You know, the first thing I think of is smart. Yep. Like I, I really want, and I work hard that the kids are smart enough and that mm-hmm. they learn the game well enough that they can play some of that situational hockey Yep. And they can make good decisions. And, you know, they make less mistakes when they make better decisions. Mm-hmm. And even, you know, especially I'll be like, I'm a risky enough coach and a forgiving enough coach that I'm like, kids, go take chances. That's the yep. only way you learn is if you go take a chance and figure the game out. Yep. But that helps get a team smarter. Yeah. Uh, if you'd asked me, 10 years ago, the funny thing is, is I would have talked about being smarter. I would have talked about compete, but mm-hmm. it would have been a little more vague. Yeah. I will work to spell out exactly what I mean to kids mm-hmm. when I say smart or when mm-hmm. I say compete level. When I talk, I will explain about what it means to win a race to a pocket. You know, the old phrase, right, that you get the puck three ways. Yep. Your teammate passes it to you, you win a race for it, race to it, or you win a battle. Yep. Well, a battle is super competitive. Mm-hmm. Winning a race is, again, really effort and competitive. And uh, getting a pass, you know, part of that, just getting open off the puck is competitive as well. Mm-hmm. So but two of those, that winning the race – and that battling for a 50-50 puck, like those are just competitive situations. Yep. And so when I talk about compete level, like I'll talk about, you know, a specific 50-50 puck situation, a specific win the race situation, 
Um, so kids understand that. Yep. So they understand that taking that guy's lane so you can go win the puck, you know, maybe taking a little bit of abuse when you go to pass the puck and you got to take a hit because you got to wait till your teammates open, you know. So I'll talk about that compete rather than being generic. I'll give them specific situations for it. Okay. Um, can you give me a successful team you've been on and then maybe why it was successful? You know, two of my favorite teams to remember. Yep. One team was, it was the first high school team that I coached that made it to the state tournament. Okay. And uh, we were a four seed. Mm -hmm. And we won our first game uh, that we expected to. And then we had to go as a visitor. So we had to go on the road. And like that team all year long, like you could just look in their eyes and that group of seniors and you could just see that they wouldn't be denied. Mm -hmm. And it was so great down that stretch of playoffs to watch those guys come out of the locker room and just see that look in their eyes. And they were, again, you know, it's usually one of the favorite teams is they were a good team. It took everybody to do it. And from top to bottom, the goaltending wasn't the greatest, to be frank, but the players like blocked shots like crazy that year to help out their goalie. And it mm -hmm. was a big physical defense defensive core. And so they kept pucks in the zone like crazy, which helped the offense. And so it was kind of a fun team to watch, but also just the determination of that team. Yeah. And they lost in the first game of the state tournament, two to one to Superior. But yep. it was a great game. You know, Superior was at the peak of their powers at that time. And everybody's yep. like, oh, you won't even be in that game. And it'll be over by the first period. And that was a game right to the end. And we're ringing uh, two shots off the post with the goalie pulled. And so that – but that team's determination, just the look of those, of those guys in their eyes coming out. The yeah. other one was – it's a little funny, but I like to talk about this team because we were 120-1. And one. So we were bad. Yeah. And we lost 20 games in a high school season. But that team, they got after it every single game. Mm -hmm. They got better every single game. They would come out and work at practice. Yep. They would listen and try and do things right. We just weren't very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but that's like to me, that's a successful team. I like to look at the end of the year and I like to think if we've overachieved, like we're successful, yep. no matter what our record was. But that team, like they had, they had fun. They learned and got better. Mm -hmm. And that could have been just a terrible year. Yep. But it was a super fun year because the guys just kept working hard and trying to do the right thing all the time. Mm hmm that's one thing that I, I've often told coaches is that before your season starts, when you're setting the values for your team and things like that, one of the great things to also define is define what your success is going to be this season, right? Um, and what I mean by that is that sometimes as a coach, you can, um, and Coach Rich, Rich did a good job of, of talking about how as you get further away from the game, you, the game gets easier to see and, and anticipate and things like that. Well, the same thing as a coach is you get to analyze your team as you step farther back. You realize sometimes that maybe that team isn't going to win a state championship, right? And as a coach, it, it's a tough thing to swallow. So your definition of success can't be, you know, winning every game and winning the state tournament, right? That that success might be uh, your definition of success. That success that season might be we got better from game one. To game 40 right um or the definitions of success might be every player bought in and worked hard they're motivated they stayed on task and things like that too so um i love the fact that you brought that second story up because it defines success not in a wins or losses way which a lot of coaches and a lot of times a lot of parents do as well but it defines success in in how much fun they had how much they how hard they worked and how much they got better, right? And that's that sometimes is something that I don't think a lot of people put a lot of stock in. That you know, success just isn't goals or assists or things like that. And um, it's one of the other things too. I, I've told parents like you know, def define your kid's success not by his goals or assists, but by his work ethic and, and his attitude, right? And and that's the same thing for a team. You can 
you know, success can be by their work ethic and by their attitude, not by their wins or losses. So, um, and as, as you've been a coach through all of these years, what are some of the rewarding parts about being a coach for yourself? I've coached long enough now that it's super rewarding to see guys that I've coached coaching their kids. Okay. Guys that I've coached officiating. Mm-hmm. Guys that I've coached even playing in men's league. Yep. Like I love to see the fact that these guys kept playing forever. Yep. You know, they go to college after high school and right. A lot of them aren't going to play division three or division one. It's a small mm-hmm. percentage of kids that continue to play a few play juniors, but a whole bunch of them, they play intramurals, yeah. you know, they play. So they keep playing hockey. Mm-hmm. I always tell these guys that one of my goals is that they're in this for life that they'll be 65 years old and they're still going to be playing and their kids are going to be playing hockey because they had so much fun playing hockey. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I want to do for them is that they just keep playing the game forever. So that might be the most rewarding thing is that I just see those guys still in the game, getting their kids in the game and they're out there, you know, and then they bring up stories of, high school and you know how much fun they had and something that happened and it's just good to talk about oh yeah and that's one of the things too like i had coach rulian and he was my college hockey coach and uh you know we had a we talked prior to him coming on and stuff like that i was trading him stories and things that he doesn't even remember anymore but they impacted my life and things like that and uh the impact and the stories you get from and you're hearing what you know, how you as a coach impact people and things like that. So, I, yeah, it's a great point. Like, I, you know, I guess I've never thought about it the other way. All the coaches have coached me and I'm coaching my kids now. And, you know, I guess that is very rewarding to see and things like that. So, um, but Wait, also. one second. Yeah. Yep. So, because you said something super important. Yep. Like you just said, you know, like the player could say something as a coach. You're like, oh, I don't even remember saying that. Yeah. It's so important all the time because the stuff you say as a coach, like you're never neutral. Yep. Right? The kids are either going to take it as good or bad. And so you have to be really careful about what you say because you're going to say stuff and you might think it's just a throwaway thing. And it's a big deal to that kid. It's a big deal. So you have to be pretty intentional about the things you say and you got to be careful. You know, you got to be careful with being sarcastic. You can't talk about other players. You can't, you know, you just have to be careful about what you say because you never know what they're going to hear and Mm -hmm. they think it's the most important thing in the world. Yep. And that's the thing too is like when I told, I told, you know, you know, as I was telling Coach Ruley about some of my stories, I told him I was scared because I had said something to him under my breath and like, and after I said it, I was like, oh my, oh my gosh, like. I can't believe I just said that, but it was like a just quick reaction. I just like, and all that. He kind of like did a quick look at me and I was like, oh boy. But I told him like, I was scared for like the next two weeks of practice, you know? And he was like, I had no idea. And I was like, <laughs> but it's just the impact that sometimes as coaches, our body language or the way we we talk, or we don't understand the impact that we're actually having at the time with these kids is, is also super important too. And that's the other thing too, is like, I can remember like some of your favorite coaches and what made them your favorite coaches. It was probably because of the way they, you know, they talked to you, the way they related to you. And I mean, I mean, think about, you know, who was your most impactful coach and then tell me why. Yeah. I had this guy, actually, the funny thing is, is this guy coached Rich too. (laughs) You know, I mean, it makes sense. I think he's one of Rich's favorite coaches. And we even talked because he's still in the area about having him come in. Mm-hmm. because we've had like when uh, old West players are around or they come to a game, yeah. we'll have them come in and say a few words between periods yeah. and talk a little bit about the legacy and what West means and mm-hmm. you know what it means to them. And we talked about having this guy come in and maybe read off the lineup at the start of the game. Yep. But that's exactly it, right? He could relate to me as a 12 year old peewee, you know, and like, I remember all the practices being fun. Yeah. And I got to be honest with you, though. I really wish that I grew up in this era because the practices now are so much more fun yeah. <laughs> than the practices I grew up with. But I still, I loved being out there. 
And, you know, it's funny because I had this coach like as a mite and then a peewee. And then my Bantam coaches were like, like I was kind of sour on those Bantam coaches. Yep. And I think a lot of it was because, you know, I related so well to him and he made everything fun. And, you know, as I recall, everything for him wasn't about the win. You know, yep. it was about playing fast and doing the right things. And if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yep. And that's kind of stuck with me. Yeah. And then so, that, that is something co- good coaches do, right? They said it was, you said your practices were fun, right? And they were exciting and things like that. And you want to play for those coaches. And and that's for me when I, when I was a kid, I love practices, right? You said t- playing in today, you love to practice in today's game. And, but like, why is that? I mean, for me, the reason why I want to play in like t- the practice structure I have is because, you know, every practice is new. It's not one of those practices where you like get in one corner and you're facing the flag going around the circles. You go to the next one, you face the flag. And the first 15 minutes of your practice every day is the same exact practice, right? And like, it's not fun skating around circles. I mean, it, there is a point to it, and it can help you build your skills. And I'm, I'm sure it was great in the 80s. But now as coaches, we, we've found a way to evolve our games to make practices fun while still accomplishing the same exact things, right? And that's where, like, you just look at the practice structures of why you love certain coaches and why sometimes kids love certain coaches because the practices are exciting, they're fun, the coach relates to them, right? And – there is a high level of compete in every practice. And I find that you have some of those ingredients at any practice. There's not a kid in the world who ain't going to love it, right? Oh, that's so yeah. right. And yeah. like I tell the story because my nephew, who is 12, he quit hockey last year. Okay. Because for two years in a row, we had the same coach. And all he would talk about is how boring the practices were. Yep. How boring the practices were. And this kid is a good athlete and he mm-hmm. loves to compete. You know, he plays baseball, he plays soccer. Like if you pick it up and if I go over there and we go to throw stuff around, like he'll turn anything into a game. Mm-hmm. But for him, the practices became so boring and it seemed like torture for him to have to go to him twice a week. Yep. So he just told his dad, nope, I don't want to do it anymore. And that like just crushes me because I'm like, are you kidding me? And you know, right? He's got a whole bunch of teammates that are the same way. Yeah. And he he would tell me that, you know, we just do some of the same things at practice. And like, I actually went and talked to the coach a little bit about it to see if I could just help out at some of the practices. Yeah. And he's just like, no, no, I got it all under control. I got it all under control. And so I kind of kept my nose out of it, but I. I'm not sure if I did the right thing by keeping my nose out of it because he would have been a good little hockey player. You know, I don't ever think it's a bad thing to bring those things up to the coaches. I've had other coaches tell me like, well, that drill's not really suited for a, you know, a 12 year old. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Let's give it a shot. And then all of a sudden I'm like, well, you're right. I wish I would have listened to you 20, you know, 20 minutes ago when I showed you the practice plan. But that is something that I think a lot of coaches, they don't realize sometimes that uh, their, their, their practice are very monotonous. They're the same thing over and over again. Like, you know, it's, oh, it's just warm up. So it's just the five. Well, why do you like, and that's, I've said it to a coach before. I'm like, why do you think every kid's late coming onto the ice with you? Because they know what your first five minutes of your practice are. They're boring. You do the same drill every single time. If I was a kid in the locker room, I wouldn't come out on time either. Right. And that's where I think if you want to run a good practice, and I'll get your thoughts on this too. If you want to run a good practice, it starts with the preparation of it. Right. Because if you're not prepared for practice, what do you generally do? when you like don't have a practice plan, because I've done it, you know, I'll admit, I've, I've made the mistakes of going into practices and not having a plan. And what ends up happening when I don't have a plan is, I run the same drills, right? <laughs> like I run the same drills. I'm not thinking like, hey, we haven't done this, or I want to do this. And the kids pick up on that. Like, I mean, it's quick, how fast they like, oh, we've done this for the third week in a row. It's like Coach Blick's not prepared. But that's, that's where you fix that. And I get your thoughts on that. Like, how do you fix the monotony of a practice? I When I talk to younger coaches, newer coaches, I actually tell them at the start of the year, write up like three or four or five practices, and I'll help you write them up. Make like a game practice with a whole bunch of little games in it. Make a practice where it's a little more flowy and the kids just get to pass and shoot and skate mm-hmm. around a real lot and make up a station practice. 
because no matter what happens during the year, you're going to run out of time. Yep. And then just get a feel for what do the kids need? Mm -hmm. Right. You're going to go up and down the ice skate and shoot, which a lot of kids love. Yep. You know, and you can pull that practice out. Or maybe it's just time for some compete and just play some games and you can pull that practice out yep. or you have a station practice right there. Yep. And so now you're kind of set. So when you run out of time, the other thing is I tell coaches, like you can't be afraid to fail. The kids will kind of, most of them will forget unless you do it every single practice. Yeah. Like if you, if a drill is not going right, like you can just scrap it. Yes. You can just scrap it. And, oh, let's go on to something else. And you can even tell the kids after practice, hey, that didn't work out, and that one was on me. <laughs> I've done that in high school practice. It'll be like, hey, that didn't work out very well, and that was on me. I didn't explain it well, and it's not – it just didn't work. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I, I think those two things are where you got to start a little bit. And then, like, it's crazy how well drills – I was out with my – my other nephew, who's the little yep. brother of the other one that quit, I went out there with his cross ice team this year because yep. I thought he's cross ice. He loves it. And he loved hockey enough that when we were out there at the end of the year, he didn't, it was his last practice of the year and he didn't want to leave the ice. He's like, I'm not leaving until the Zamboni kicks me off because they blew the buzzer at the end of the hour. And he just kept skating around. Yeah. And the Zamboni didn't come out for like seven minutes. And then his – cousin that I was going to help at their practice. They were Bantams. Mm -hmm. They had a full sheet practice for 90 minutes because a game had been canceled. Okay. And he's like, can I come out? And I'm like, yep. He stayed out there for the whole 90 minutes, mostly skating on his own because while I worked with uh, part of the Bantams on some skills, he was just out there cruising around. Mm -hmm. But to square up the circle, like when I would be out there with this cross ice practices, we did some of the same shooting and puck protection drills that we did with our high school team. Yep. Especially some of our warm up drills because we ran some different warm up drills with our high school team this year at the start of practice with no goalie in the net. Okay. So we could just choo, 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 choo. And the guys could have their feet moving and take a ton of shots and they would have to go collect the puck if it missed the net and pass it back to the line. So they were chasing pucks and driving down to recollect them and to keep the drill moving. And I did it with these little cross ice guys shooting against the boards and it worked great. And we did some puck protection ones where they just had to protect the cone and the other guys trying to get the puck to the cone and where they had to just, you know, a lot of it was just play. Yep. <laughs> but uh, it went right from a high school practice right to cross ice and worked great. And there was one or two of them that didn't. And I just yep. looked at the other coaches. I'm like, okay, on to the next one. <laughs> so when you plan your practice, like, you know, sometimes you're like, okay, this is a new drill. Yep. Maybe this is going to take a little bit longer. Or maybe we just got to be ready to scrap it. Yep. And then we'll come back to it. The kids kind of have an idea now and we'll come back to it later. So you kind of, when you look at your practice and that's part of the preparation, yeah. right? You know, and you have your practice plan, you'd be like, Oh, okay. We'll see how this goes. And so you're ready either way, yep. you know, expect the best, prepare for the worst. You said two things there that I have probably never thought about doing. And I just want to bring those up again. Um, and that was, you at the beginning of the season, you you make practice plans that are ready to go, right? Um, now it got me even thinking, like, why wouldn't you create ten to fifteen practice plans? Because that's the, one of the problems that coaches have is being able to prepare for a, a practice, right? Because they got work, they got family life, they got dinner. You know, you get out of work at five p.m. You got to have pick up the kids, get them home by six. Dinner. Next thing you know, practice at, for a seven p.m. practice, you're walking in at six forty-five, and you're like, oh boy, I forgot the practice plan. Right, you forgot to prepare, so then you run back into that monotonous drills of that you've done in the past. Where what you said there is brilliant is that at the beginning of the season, make 10 practice plans, right? That yep. way, they're your fallback practice plans that you can use when you when you know life gets a little bit you know filling, when you're a little bit busy and things like that. Because it happens to every single one of us where you know the day happens and you're like, oh boy, I've got the practice plan, but make those 10 to 15 before the season starts and then just fall back to those. It's okay to do. The other thing I love what you said there was don't be afraid to go ask 
like, don't be afraid to go ask another coach for his practice plan that day. Like, grab the UA coach because they can translate. They're doing the same things over and over again. Yeah. And, like, if it doesn't work with that UA practice, then just grab it. Like, those are two things that I think that are brilliant that, I mean, I'm probably going to start doing myself is just make those practice plans ahead of time. And then the day where the life gets a little bit busy on you, just pull one of those out. Don't go to the old well and, you know, try to think of drills on the fly because generally you're going to be thinking of drills that you've done in the past that the kids are going to be like, ugh. Like, so, And yeah. part of the problem is, is for some guys, the drills they did in the past, especially if they're, you know, kids are younger, you know, they're squirt yep. age, they think back to the drills that they did at their yep. practices. Mm -hmm. They don't remember when they were a squirt, but they remember when they were a Bantam or a high school player. And so they just go back to those. Yeah. And so there's better ones now anyways. Yeah. They can think of better ones. But it is hard. You know, if you have a 530 practice or a 515, you're really running from work, get your son or daughter and get to the rink. Like it's mm -hmm. hard. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the other thing too. I remember I walked into a rink and I had a, um, we were running a camp and uh, it was in Wanakee. And uh, they asked us to come in as a guest instructor that day. And one of the things I thought was brilliant is they had the coach's locker room and we were getting ready. And one of my coaches got up and he started looking at this binder and inside the binder was, I mean, it was a stack of practice plans that big. And I was like, you know, at first I was laughing. I'm like, what, what is this? And I, you know, like, and I was like, oh, okay. And then it dawned on me afterwards that it's because if you are a coach coming to the rink and something happens where you're not prepared, you always have a fallback plan, right? Wanaki for their coaches had that fallback plan. If they needed a drill, they could go to the well, right? They can go to one of those. If they needed something for an entire practice, well, it's there, right? Because life happens. It's tough. But yep. they, it's not a bad idea for your association to have that booklet ready to go for your coaches so that the, that the practices are going to be good. So, um, well. That, that really is a good idea because yeah. sometimes you forget, like when you've been coaching for 10, 15, 20 years, like you have so many drills in your head. Yep. Or you watch the game and you're like, oh, I can turn that into a drill. And I can mm -hmm. say, okay, I can make that game thing happen in practice. Where for somebody who it's a second year coaching or he's got those mm -hmm. squirts out there, and it's so important that those squirts have a good environment and have yep. fun where they won't be around as Bantams and they won't be around when it gets to high school. Mm -hmm. The game gets a little bit harder and the yes. game gets a little bit more physical and there's not, you know, the same reward. So they still have to be successful and have fun or they're yep. not going to stick with it. Yep. Um, that was a great topic. Thanks for, I mean, that's lightened to me right now. Um, one of the other things I want to talk about is, is, is advice for youth hockey parents. Um, now that advice can be anything you want, but in general, um, like coach Rich brought up, um, you know, like, you know, remembering the game and things like that. He had a great thing of advice for the parents on, um, you know, the game goes by quick. So, you know, relish what you're in right now. So what a piece of advice do you have for hockey parents? Hmm, that's a tricky one because uh, yeah. I do a good job of avoiding parents when I'm coaching. <laughs> I know, you know, what I talk to a lot of times about, you know, for the parents is really like, watch your kid. Yep. Some parents will feel a little guilty because they don't watch the team. They just watch their kid. And I'm like, no, yep. that's what you get to do and really enjoy it and be super forgiving. Yep. Be super forgiving because they're going to make a whole bunch of mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure they know that you love to watch them play. You know, I got lucky. Like my parents didn't know anything about the game. Yep. I think as they got older and they'd watched a million games since I have four brothers that uh, they thought they knew a lot about the game, but they rarely said that. Yeah. They would come to watch games. They would stand in the corner by themselves, watch the game and then say, Hey, that was a good game. Did you have fun playing? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> you know, life goes on. And so I always felt like, like I was playing to have fun. Yep. And so I got pretty lucky there. And so I, I'll tell parents, like, make sure your kid's playing that. They're playing so they have fun. They're not playing mm -hmm. for you. They're not playing for somebody else. They're playing because they have fun playing. Yep. And that's what's going to keep them in the game longer, right? Yes. Yeah. And it can be tricky, right? Because there's so much going on. I mean, it's hard. 
I mean, parents do pay good money. Yep. They don't want to see it go to waste. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and that's a priority for coaches, I think, to make sure why, why the practices are run well and why there's a great environment mm -hmm. and that their kid is having fun every time they show up at the rink. Yeah. And I think that's part of it. Yeah. It's, it's a, having fun is, is, and, and I think it's what we talked about earlier, defining success. Right. And we talked about defining success at the, at the team level. And um, you realize that defining success at the player level changes, right? Because as a, you know, intro kid walking into the game, that's all about fun, right? A hundred percent. You got to have fun or the kid's not coming back, right? Because you're learning how to skate on a thing that's an eighth, eighth, of, a, uh, eighth of an inch thick and it's hard. It's, 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 it's difficult, but if you're not having fun, the kid's not going to come back for year two. So that's one of the things is like, as we get older, your definition of a success for a parent has to evolve. The biggest thing is for a parent, and I've told this to a lot of parents, is you want to make sure that when that kid hits that th those in those big years, 13, 14, that the fire inside them still burns, right? And the only way to get there is by having it be fun and entertaining for the kids at the younger levels. And their definition of, of individual success, like, can't be wins and losses and goals and assists, because some of that stuff's out of your control. The only things that are really in a kid's control at those years, like I said before, was attitude and effort. That's it. And that's the way, that's the way when I look at my, my daughter's play right now, I look at them and I say, well, like, if, did they have a good attitude on the ice and did they put forth effort? Like, I, I don't care if, you know, they're also U8. It's like, I don't, if they score a goal, great. But you know what? If they had fun and they put in effort, that's all I care about. And that should be no different than a kid at squirts and peewees. Like, focus on that because what a parent wants, if you want, if you, like, we all want our kids to go to that next level, right? Like, it's it's hard to say we don't. But if they're not willing, the kid's not willing to train by themselves and have fun doing it, the chances of them succeeding to the NCAA level or higher is, is, is not that high. So as coaches and as parents, we need to cultivate that fun at the younger levels and, and change our definition of success of success so um it, like as coaches your value can't be about winning yep that can't be how you value yourself as wins and the same mm -hmm. thing with the parents they they just like that's gonna just cause trouble no matter what yep uh, and then i think the transition starts to happen peewees bantams of where and this is part on coaches mm -hmm. part on parents but a big chunk is on the coaches of how hard work can be fun yeah and that competitive because that's where that transition happens a little bit of hey it's good enough to just be out there having fun you know that hard work can be fun and putting yeah. that effort and seeing some results and you know when a kid's a squirt he doesn't know that hey starting in october and then look how much better i got in february Mm -hmm. Bantams, they can start to think about that abstract a little bit and say, hey, if I keep putting a little bit in every day, by the end of the season, I'm going to have a whole bunch. And that's yeah. going to feel good. Mm -hmm. It's going to make me feel better about myself, about what I did. And hard work can be fun and hard work can be rewarding. Mm -hmm. And that's a big transition then. But if they don't have that foundation of having fun playing hockey, like you said earlier, like yep. that's not going to work. And building off that last comment you just had about getting better from February or excuse me, from, you know, September to February. One of the things I tell a lot of my kids is, and it's something I, I believe Sidney Crosby said it, that sometimes kids define getting better based on their peers, right? Oh, I got better than so-and-so today, or I got better than him. Um, or I'm, I'm on, I was third line at the beginning of the season. Now I'm on second. So I must've gotten better where I always tell kids when you're looking at improving your skills, don't judge yourself by your peers. Judge yourself to how you were yesterday, right? If you can tell yourself that you got better, you were a better hockey player than you were the day before, and you can incrementally get better each day, then that's when, at like you said, at the bantam level, you can see that. Like you can see that change, and it's, it might be difficult for a squirt, but when you're trying to get better, don't judge yourself by your peers. Judge yourself by how you were yesterday. And I think as bantams, and as you get older, you start to see that evolve in the kids, and you know that's why. Some kids love working out by themselves. They know that when they're working out, they're getting better, right? 
So that's yeah. a huge challenge for coaches of second year peewees and bantams, mm -hmm. I think, because the kids really start to compare themselves to their peers. Yeah. They really, really start to compare themselves to their peers. And that's why it's important. We just started this a couple years ago. I'm not sure how long ago, but it was a few years ago with the post game. What did we do well? Mm -hmm. You know, what needs work? Why are we better today? And one of the things I like about that is it gives a lot of kids a chance to say something in the locker room post game. Yep. And the coach, it gives you a chance to reward and recognize kids yep. that maybe made like one or two plays that we worked on in practice and it showed up in the game and you can reward that kid. So he can mm -hmm. see, Oh, I did get better at that. Yep. He doesn't think so much of, you know what? Johnny scored 40 goals and there's no way I'm, you know, I've scored one. Yep. But this way they think I am part of the team and I'm doing something. Mm -hmm. And so we started it a few years ago at our high school team. And I know Rich has done it with his youth team and my brother started doing it with his. And those are the only three things we do post game. What went well, what needs work and why are we better today? And it yeah. gives kids a chance to speak up and it gives you as a coach time to hear what the kids think. <laughs> and you can think about it then and then be like, Oh, you know, you that showed up. You did that. We did that in practice the other day. You did it in the game. That's just what we we're working on, pump protection, yeah. whatever. And the kid, you know, walked out of the locker room feeling great. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, that is all the questions I have. I just want to say this has been an awesome, awesome experience for me as a coach again. Like, it's, I feel like we're back at the Coleman Cup. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> I'm learning from you as we go. Um, that's why I love doing these because I think I'm getting so much information from you guys as coaches. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. And uh, do you have any last things you'd like to add? Uh, no, but it does remind me of the Coleman Cup because, yeah. like, that was hilarious because we were we didn't know each other. Yep. We kind of went on the ice. Yep. And then – all that, and then went right into the office, still talking yep. about everything. Yep, yep. So I just want to say thank you again. And, um, oh, you're welcome. You know, and uh, this has been fantastic. But I just also want to remind people that every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we are on Views from the Bench at 12 o'clock noon on Facebook Live. On Friday, we have uh, Coach Grant Geisbers. He coaches wheel teams, Coleman Cup teams. He's a hockey factory instructor and everything like that. So he's going to be a great interview as well. So, Steve, thanks so much for coming on. And uh, I'm going to say that's awesome. <laughs> So, all right. Have a good day, guys. Yep.